Hello and welcome back. I feel like I need to create some kind of like greeting that I can say every time when I start my videos just because I always feel so awkward starting out. Yes, I do have a wombat on my t-shirt. I'm very proud of this purchase. I bought this secondhand. I just happened to find a wombat's t-shirt on Depop or Depop? I don't know how you say it, but it's an app where people can sell secondhand clothing. I also like that if someone looking at this t-shirt doesn't know that it's a band t-shirt, they'll just think I'm a big fan of wombats, which I also am, so it has a double purpose, I feel. So in April, I read a whopping seven books. I thought I'd read six, and then looking at my Goodreads, I realized I forgot one, which doesn't bode well. Normally, to prepare for the wrap-ups, I kind of go through every book that I've read in the month just to remind myself of what it was about and jot down a few notes on my thoughts on them, which I should start doing as soon as I've read the book, really, but I am very lazy. But because I read so many books, I couldn't be bothered doing that, so fingers crossed I can remember what each book is about and this video doesn't become a long, winding mess. So I think one of the reasons I managed to get through a lot of books for me anyway, I should clarify, I know a lot of people read way more than seven every month. For me, it was a lot. And I think one of the reasons that I did get through so many was because I started off with A Room with a View by E.M. Forster and I read the whole book over the Easter weekend. This book starts off with Lucy Honeychurch. She is a young British lady from the Edwardian era and she is on holiday in Italy with her cousin Charlotte. They're staying at this, it's not really a hotel, it's more like a big house that rents out rooms to British tourists, run by a lady who Lucy is very saddened to discover has a Cockney accent. So yeah, they're on holiday, staying with a bunch of other British people that they slowly get to know over the course of their holiday. And that's the first half of the book. Something happens in Italy that is a little bit scandalous for the time anyway. And then the second half of the book skips forward to Lucy being back in her family home in Britain. That half of the story talks about the consequences of the thing that happened in Italy. So I thought I'd read this before, but I realized that I'd only seen the film, the 90s film I think it is, starring Helen Bottom Carter. So I had a vague idea of the plot before starting it, but I had sort of an enjoyable experience of remembering scenes from the film as I got to them in the book. I adore Ian e. Forster's writing. I need to read the rest of his novels because I've only read his two sort of, I think they're known as his like nicest books, Howard's End and this one. And this is such a lovely book. In terms of the description, it made me want to go to Italy and to England. It's so evocative of summer and the amazing landscapes of those countries. He really evokes a sense of culture in each country. Another thing I love about Ian Forster is his characters. None of them are purely good or bad. They are truly human people with both positive and negative things about their characters. Lucy Honeychurch is a really interesting protagonist because you feel in the narration that Ian Forster is a little bit condescending towards her because she is kind of a very straightforward, relatively simple person. She doesn't think too much outside of the box at the beginning of the book, but she does kind of grow up and evolve by the end of the story and it truly is a really great character development, I think. And the themes in it are really interesting and because I have such a terrible memory, to be honest, I couldn't tell you in proper words exactly what those were, which is why I need to start writing these things down after I've read the books. I think, as far as I remember, the themes are kind of about independence of thought. There are two characters called the Emersons, as the old Mr. Emerson and his son, younger George Emerson, and they're staying in Italy as well, and a lot of the other characters don't really like them because they're seen as eccentric, but the author definitely presents them in a very sympathetic way because even if he doesn't agree with everything that the characters believe in, they've come to those conclusions because of logical thought rather than society dictating what they should think. And and how flimsy societal constructs can be in terms of class and gender. would highly recommend if you've never read an Ian e. Forster. It's definitely the one to start with because it's just so pretty. The second book I read in April was Every Day by David Letheth. Then Levithan? Levithan. By David Levithan. I read this because I am kind of curious to see the film adaptation because it stars Angari Rice, who is an Australian actress who I think is really great. And she's so young, but she's already so talented. It is about an entity called A. They are a person who wakes up in a different body every single day. And so they have their own thoughts and feelings and personality, but they have to walk around in this other person's body and try and work out what to do and say so as not to stuff up this other person's life.
life. So A wakes up in the body of the boyfriend of a girl called Rhiannon and he instantly falls in love with her. And at first I was kind of like, that's really unbelievable. Why would he pick this one girl over all the other people he must have met in his life? They didn't seem anything particularly special about her and the way she was described, it was kind of like pixie manic dream girl vibes to me. Because it's from A's first person perspective, we are seeing inside the mind of someone who is in love. And I think the book was trying to talk about how love is so subjective. Rhiannon's not meant to be someone that everyone would fall in love with. She was just a person that A fell in love with. So the whole thing with A waking up in a different body is that they only ever wake up in the body of someone their own age. So only 16 year olds and they never go very fast. So the next body A wakes up in will be maybe a town away, but they won't be a country away. So obviously the main theme of the book is to be able to see people for who they really are, regardless of their gender or race or sexuality. And I did really find it interesting when A was talking about the details of how it feels to be in these different bodies. So there's one body that A ends up in who has depression, and A explains that the depression is part of the physical body itself, it's not part of the person. So A themselves feels depressed because they're feeling all the physical aspects of that body, which I thought was a really interesting way to look at it. I definitely did enjoy this book, pretty much just an enjoyable read. Number three on my list is The Bookshop by Penelope Fitzgerald. I also read this because there is a film adaptation coming out. This book is set in 1959 in a small British seaside town, and the main character is an older lady called Florence Green. She is a widow with a small inheritance, so she decides to open a bookshop in the town. She opens it in this old building that's been empty and derelict for ages so she doesn't think anyone would mind her taking it over but then for some reason the rich upper class lady in the town decides that she wants that building for an art center and so in a kind of surreptitious polite way that British people in those times apparently did things she starts a campaign against Florence to try and get rid of the bookshop. The main feature of this book is definitely the writing. I really loved the descriptions of the village. It was really evocative, really visual writing and the character descriptions as well were really great. The author managed to really capture these very definitely kind of eccentric individual characters with just a few words. I feel like the plot ran in the subtext as opposed to on the surface if that makes sense. And I think the book was mainly an examination of the British class system and kind of just making general comments on British village life. I really love this book. I just enjoyed being in the little world of the book. It's such a short book. I think it's like less than 200 pages. It was just a really pleasant place to be. I probably would have given it five stars but I got so saddened by the ending. I don't want to spoil it but it did have like a relatively sad ending and I was so invested in the life of Florence Green that I reduced a star in sort of sadness and anger that the author did this to the character. The fourth book I read in April was Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman. This book is obviously about Eleanor Oliphant. She is a very reclusive person living in Glasgow. She's in her 30s. She's working in the same office job that she's worked in for over 10 years and she has a pretty solid routine of work and then being at home and drinking a lot of vodka. I feel like everybody must have read this book by now. I really enjoyed it. It didn't grab me personally, I guess, but I just enjoyed it as a really good read. I did kind of relate to Eleanor in kind of the same way that I related to the main character of The Rosie Project. I'm not sure what that says about me. Eleanor has a tragic backstory that is supposed to kind of explain the way she is, and I didn't hate the tragic backstory, but I kind of get annoyed when authors feel the need to explain their characters or behaviours. I mean, some people just behave that way because that's just the way they are, and and I don't think giving a reason for it added any value to the story, but obviously the plot actually hinges on her tragic backstory and finding out what happened to her. So taking out the tragic backstory would have taken out the intrigue of the book, but I think I would have found the character more believable in a way if she didn't have a reason for the way that she acted. But yeah, I still really enjoyed it and I really loved the cover of the copy of the book that I was reading as well. There's like two covers that are going around and the one I had I much prefer. Number five is another book that I read because the film is coming out or is out right now actually and it is The Guernsey Potato. You know I was going to get that wrong. The Guernsey Literary Potato. The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society. 
did it. I have the cover of the book. And that is by Mary Ann Schaffer and Annie Barrows. So I read the backstory of why there are two authors and it's really sad. The first author, Mary Ann Schaffer, died before fully completing the book and so her, I think it's her niece, Annie Barrows, was also a writer and finished off the book. I was also astonished to find that they are Americans because the book is one of the most incredibly British books I've ever read. But maybe that makes sense that they're Americans because they obviously were in love with that kind of a very 1940s British style of talking. And I do think after a while that style felt a little bit forced. It didn't feel like it came naturally from the authors. This book is an epistolary book. That means that the book is written in the form of letters from various characters. The main character is Juliet. She is a writer. During the war she had a column in the newspaper. It was a humorous column about the war in general but now the war is over she is trying to find a topic for her next book. I think <sighs> See, I can't even remember the plot of this book and this was like one of the more recent books I read. I think one of the members of the literary society on Guernsey writes to her and that's how she finds out about them. She starts corresponding with several of the members of the society and eventually goes to Guernsey to meet up with them. This was definitely a really cute book and you could tell it was really well researched. For the most part it didn't feel too much like the authors had done all this research and found cool things that they were interested in and then wanted to write a story around that. I think some parts of it were a little bit clunky in that respect. Despite Juliet definitely being a caricature of British women from the 40s, I did still enjoy her tone of voice. So many of the things she said made me laugh and she was so stiff upper lip, witty British woman. The bits of the book where I was a little bit bored were letters from some of the other characters. I just didn't find them as interesting as Juliet herself. I think the book would have been better, though obviously more limited in what it could talk about, if it had stuck to either just Juliet herself or maybe chosen like three characters perspectives to write from. I think there were just a bit too many and I got a bit confused about who was who. Towards the end of the novel I started believing in it a little bit less. The way Juliet was just welcomed with open arms into the Guernsey society. I should have said the whole thing about Guernsey was that it was occupied by Nazis during World War II and it was during that time that the literary society was created. There's a small child on the island whose mother was taken away to a German prison in camp and so other members of the society are looking after the child and then Juliet almost within days of her being there is basically just looking after this child full time and that seemed a little bit unbelievable like would these people really just let this five-year-old hang out with this strange woman from London? It is definitely an enjoyable read and actually I've owned two copies of this book for several years. Weirdly I got it as a birthday present from like a friend's mum but like a childhood friend and I don't really see them that often so randomly the mum gave me a birthday present one year and I was like that's cool I'll take a book anytime but then the next year she got me another present and got me the exact same copy of this book so that was really weird um, so I actually still have two copies of it because I'm too lazy to go and take it to the secondhand bookshop that would have been about five years ago and I finally got around to reading it I'm very interested to see the film because it has so many amazing British actors in it the sixth book I read in April was The Colour Purple by Alice Walker this book chronicles the life of Seeley. She is an African-American woman in the 1920s, well it starts off in the 1920s. She comes from a very poor family and she suffers an enormous amount of trauma and just a lot of horrible things happen to her. Her father abuses her, he then marries her off and her husband abuses her and it follows Seeley's life from her as a child all the way up to her as an old lady. Basically the themes of the book are about racism in America during that era and about the disregard that men had for women at that time, how they genuinely just treated them as possessions. In the story, the women eventually band together and become so much stronger than their male counterparts. And Celie is also a lesbian, which is amazing to see that representation in a book set in the 20s. And the book definitely also talks about religion. And there's a character in the book who I think is expressing the views of the author, saying that religion is not found in a church and should not be dictated to them by white people. People. and even that the Bible was just written by white people and she preaches to Celie that God is in everything and so that you shouldn't be shamed and be told that enjoying yourself is sinful because her reasoning is why would God dislike something that made you happy. Yeah, I'm definitely really glad I read it. It is definitely a modern classic. The final book I read in April was On Chesil Beach by Ian McEwan. The third book that I read this month that I read because the film adaptation is coming out. I'm genuinely so excited to see this film adaptation because I love Saoirse Ronan and I also love the male actor that's in 
I can't remember his name, but he is really good. So I've tried to read Ian McEwan before in that I tried to read Atonement and I really didn't like it. I didn't like the film of Atonement either, which also had Sir Sharon in it, funnily enough. I don't know what it is about Atonement, but I just hated the characters. I found it really boring after like the first few chapters which were really intriguing. My mum loves Ian McEwan and she says that Atonement is nothing like his other books so I forgot I had a copy of the book still with me. So I thought I'd give this one a go because it is only 160 pages and I think this is definitely going to be one of my favourites of the year. It's the first book I've given five stars to this year as well. I just was so swept up in it. So this is about a young couple called Florence and Edward. They are only 22. They've just been married. They are beginning their honeymoon eating dinner in a hotel by Chisel Beach and through the open door to the bedroom they can see the four poster bed where they are expected to consummate their marriage. Edward is really looking forward to this but Florence is terrified. The story of them meeting and falling in love and their lead up to them being married is told in seamless flashbacks. So that first scene of them in the bedroom continues on until the end of the book and interspersed between the present day is flashbacks both from Edward's and Florence's point of view. Mostly what I loved about this is the writing style. It was so evocative and beautiful and the words Ian McEwan used I'm just like what is in your brain that makes you think to use those words? They're amazing. The way he describes people and places and actions is just completely masterful. I'm envious of the way he can write. I really like the way there was a kind of omnipresent narration. Ian McEwan himself is kind of making comments on the society and comparing it to the society before the 1960s and after the 1960s is a real examination of what it means to be young. He says that in 1962 when this is set, being a young adult was an inconvenience between being a child and being a proper adult. He then says that five years later being young would be seen as the most amazing best thing, sort of talking about the swinging 1960s and the youth culture that arose during that time. And there's other little comments like that throughout the book that I just really enjoyed. I like the way that he was applying critical thought to the time. There was a real reason as to why he set this book in the 1960s. So when Florence was talking about being terrified of sex, that instantly made me think she was asexual, which was really exciting because you do not get a lot of asexual representation in books or films or anywhere at all and people barely know what being asexual means. But then there is implied that there is a bit of a tragic backstory that is the reason why she is afraid of sex, which kind of made me sad. And especially in this book when it's kind of just implied, it's not ever spoken out loud. I feel like that tragic backstory definitely could have been taken out of this book and it would not have made the book any less powerful at all. But that's pretty much the only qualm I had with the book. But yeah, so I really love this. I would highly recommend. It has everything that I want in a book. Like old world Britain, amazing writing, really interesting themes, and um, and it's really short, so it's really quick to read. Oh, I have been filming for 50 minutes. I usually only film for about 20 to half an hour, so this is going to take me ages to edit, but we got through it in the end. Thank you so much for watching this marathon wrap up, and I will see you in my next video. Bye!